welcome everyone. Uh, so we're here on this online panel um, organized uh, by FIAC and who invited us uh, to discuss uh, the exhibition Otros Mundes, uh, created by uh, Humberto Moro. So we're here with Humberto, with uh, Paloma Contreras Lomas, who is an artist in the show, Miguel Calderon, who is also an artist in the show as Romeo Gomez Lopez. And I am Magalia Riola, director of the museum. So I think uh, for those who aren't like really um, acquainted with the museum, this is a, like a national museum that is run by the government. And it was an initiative of uh, Rufino Tamayo, who was uh, like a, an artist uh, from the 20th, early 20th century. And he slowly built over the years this collection of contemporary art, international contemporary art. And that's why the vocation of the museum is really to uh, display uh, the work of different artists from uh, different parts of the world in the benefit of the, the Mexican public. Since in his time in the early 1980s, it wasn't that common that we could have like this kind of global um, access to different uh, artistic manifestations. As you know, as we all know, and as we are all sadly aware, uh, so we're just still in the middle of a pandemic. It's been over a year that we're in this kind of situation. The museum was closed for uh, over six months. And then we had like the great luck to open again. And as um, an initiative of Humberto, uh, we started working on, on this exhibition. So Humberto started doing like all sorts of um, studio visits, remote, most of them. And that was really like the starting point of the project. I think uh, there's like many, many uh, points that we should discuss and that we would need to discuss uh, because it's, it's been like really a long time since we don't have, uh, not only in the museum, but like probably also in Mexico City, uh, an exercise like this one. Humberto will tell us more about it. But, uh, and probably one of the, the um, particularities that I would like to uh, start with discussing is the fact that uh, specifically, since I was saying the museum has like this international vocation, we um, decided during the pandemic that we wanted to work with artists from Mexico City specifically for many reasons, but we can go to that later. So uh, Humberto, would you tell us more about your exhibition and where like the, the idea originates? Sure, um, and thank you Magali for uh, inviting us on this panel and thank you everyone for being here. I think uh, this exhibition started in a conversation with you uh, a, a year ago. And I was very interested in the idea that many cities around the world, many capitals that are uh, sort of like center points for contemporary art have exhibition formats in big institutions that are sort of like surveying the city and reviewing what's happening in a specific community. And I didn't feel that necessarily Mexico City, there was uh, an environment which fostered this kind of exhibitions or that was preoccupied by um, articulating what was happening in the city. So, you know, like as many other places in the world, this idea of the local versus the global is an idea that has been Ex yeah, discussed many times and in many forms. Um, and this sort of tension that not only happens in, in these cities, but specifically for Museo Tamayo is part of its mission uh, to study this idea of, of what an international art means. And obviously, um, since the museum was founded in 1981, uh, the sort of internationality that Rufino Tamayo was addressing was has changed a lot with mobility and with uh, the, the economy of traveling and with um, technology, with social media. So in a way, um, I think the point of the departure of this exhibition is that the artists themselves can be a receptacle of this so-called internationality and how and, and to think about what sort of exchanges there are being uh, created between people that live in the city 
and that are from the city of, or from other regions of Mexico and from people that come from many other different countries and what sort of like exchange and dialogue are, is happening with uh, those specific communities. So that was sort of like the starting point of this exhibition. Um, obviously with the pandemic, it became more evident, I think for us, that we needed to do a show like this because uh, also it's, it's, a, it's an important time for institutions to uh, focus their attention in, in what's close, what's around in the communities that inhabit the spaces uh, and, and, and are, are part, are active part of, of, of the programs of the museums. So that's how sort of like the, the, the show arise as a feasible project and something that, that we were interested in doing. And as you said, uh, there, was a, there was a research uh, stage in which I sort of connected with many artists working in, this, in the city, not necessarily from Mexico, but from many countries. Uh, we have in the show, we have artists from uh, Latin America, from Ecuador, from Venezuela, from Republica Dominicana in the Caribbean, from Hawaii, from many cities of the United States. So it was, it was, uh, it was a time to search of what kind of discourses uh, were being addressed and discussed by the work of artists. And from the beginning, this was an exhibition project that put a special attention in privileging the voice of artists and put art first. So it was, it was more, I think, rather than to create a curatorial argument with the work, it was more the, the opposite. It was to let the work create those specific arguments and to, and to sort of like naturally see how they related. And that sort of like derived in four, um, uh, four exhibition groups uh, in which the exhibition is uh, divided. Uh, the, one, the first one is uh, titled Capitalism and Domination, which speaks about um, the sort of like macro forces that discipline uh, the bodies and, and, and disciplined citizens in a way, in, in the improper in ways of capitalism. Uh, the second one speaks about uh, seriality and identity and what sort of stories are uh, fallen into oblivion. Um, the third group speaks about entropy and about how we visualize and experience the world. And the last one is perhaps the most abstract and, and I think uh, complex. Uh, which speaks about bo body and materiality uh, with, with, a, with a strong emphasis on landscape and how we relate to, to, to the natural world. Um, so yeah, those sort of like four big groups were sort of like naturally emerged in conversations with artists. And um, this, is, this is an exhibition also that has a lot of commissions. Um, almost half of the work was either created for the exhibition or was done on site or, or in, in, a, in a way is a reinterpretation of something that was done before, but that was mixed with uh, a different uh, body of work. So it was sort of like also an opportunity for artists to revise their own production, their own relationship with the city. Uh, and something that, that interested me a lot uh, that I you know, like now that we have opened the show uh, I've seen how much tension it has created was the idea that the museum belongs to some demographic or some kind of artist no uh, there's this idea that institutions are um, sort of like this entity that has that that is sacred that should not be desacralized and, and for many people, this is a problem because they cannot understand how younger artists are coexisting in, a, in an environment where there are uh, more established artists. And I think that's a tension point that should be addressed and that this exhibition particularly uh, takes on. You know, what, what does it mean for, a, for you know, like an, uh, 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 an, an artist that's um, super established like Francis Alice or, or you know, like Mario Garcia Torres, that, that what does it mean for them to inhabit uh, uh, a space uh, where there are very young artists, and, and what 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 sort of communication it is that there is between generations? And I think that's also why we um, sort of like invited artists from different uh, um, 
ages and different stages in their career. Like we have Miguel here, who's uh, who's, a, who's, a, who's an established artist who has been part of the artistic community for many years, uh, who was also part of a, La Panaderia and a generation that sort of like pushed the envelope in a, in a certain time. We have Paloma, who's also involved with Bikini Wax, who you know, like in the past decade have, have created very interesting conversations. And we have Romeo, who in, in recent years founded Salon Silicon, who's talking about gender and about uh, equality and about many other discourses that are relevant for global conversations. So I think um, the sort of like selection of artists that we're uh, talking with today also is very representative of the mechanics of what the show does, because it's thinking about uh, not only their um, their creation uh, individually, but also what they do uh, collectively and what sort of uh, role as a as cultural agents they have in a specific community so i think you know like more or less this is kind of like the the, the infrastructure in which uh the, the the exhibition was built um i think it, it was an exhibition built out of urgency and it reflects that i think it's it's a it, it's an exhibition of our time that reflects uh, um, many um, things that are uh, ideas, notions that artists are discussing and thinking about and they're pre preoccupied with. Like there's a lot of ideas of uh, motherhood, domesticity, anxiety, um, resilience, uh, these ideas that are just now part of our, our imaginary and part of, of the things that we're thinking domestically every day. So it's also, it's also a way for us to connect to a broader audience in terms of how um, the artistic uh, act or the art making is not is not really distant to to people's everyday life and and that's that that was also a, an important point for me just to think as artists as mothers or as uh, workers or as uh, people that are inhabiting different universes at the same time and then you know the, the question with the title I think, um, I, I, I've been personally touched uh, by the ideas on Afrofuturism and how people that have theorized on Afrofuturism really are rethinking history, but not to not to change history, but to change the future. And 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 I was um, that was sort of like at the back of my head, just thinking how we can uh, include these conversations where artists are reimagining their own world with different rules, uh, you know, like abolishing patriarchy, thinking about work conditions, uh, you know, like thinking about domesticity. How, we, how can we connect the dots between what the artists are, are thinking and what the public is being fed by popular culture, uh, so to speak? And I think this show particularly um, things about making those universes and making those worlds available for, for, for the public to discern, to discuss, to repel in such case or to, to follow. I think uh, I would love to hear, you know, like now, like the, the three of you, uh, as Umberto said, I, I think like this kind of um, like exhibitions and, and like survey exercise are great like to create uh, both to create context and both to give an interpretation of the context. And as he said, it was like really interesting for us to um, like articulate in this panel, like these different perspectives, no? Like specifically, I would love to, to hear you talk about what it means for you, you know, like coming from these three different generations and coming from these three um, like different alternative spaces that were of course, you know, like each one of them created in a very, you know, like different time frame, and of course responding to a very different situation. When Miguel and I were like probably Romeo's and Paloma's age, because we're like a different generation, same generation, both of us, uh, the reality is that the museums weren't like really available for us and for our generation of artists to, to ex exhibit. So that's why, um, a place like La Panaderia and there were others uh, were created and then you know like all of that slowly migrated to the institutional scene. In your case I'm assuming and I would love to hear you both and of course Miguel too uh, 
there's there there needs to be a reason for you to have created you know like both spaces and i think like both spaces have like very different profiles no so i would love to hear you know like both uh what what your like the, the spaces you all created responded to and what it means for you to now being able to to expand you know like the conversation with within an institutional framework so i don't know maybe miguel since you are the oldest with me yes <laughs> Sure. Uh, um, I mean, for me, I think that the beauty of what ties us together right this second is that we all created, including the show that you and Umberto got together, is that they were all born out of a necessity. You know, in, in the 90s, there were a lot of things going on, a lot of people reading art magazines, you know, I, I saw a lot of work that looked like English art, you know, people read a lot of art magazines but people weren't really looking in front of what, weren't really looking into what was in front of them. So La Panaderia was born out of a necessity, basically. And, uh, you know, dealing with galleries, with museums. I mean, I, I remember my experience uh, and specifically going to Tamayo was completely different than that one, what happened uh, at this show. You know, I, I was, really shocked to see the artists uh, let loose, you know, and take over the museum. And that felt very, very refreshing for me. It was a confirmation that, you know, people like me and Magali who have been involved in the art world for so long, we've somehow been doing things right. And for me, it was, uh, you know, it was a celebration am amongst what's going on, you know, in the grimness of these times um, to be able to be part of the show and to really let loose and to really be in touch in a small scale with all these artists, you know, and to connect with you, Romeo, with con to connect with uh, Paloma. Yeah, I, as I was saying, Romeo ended up being in a scene of my film. You know, this maybe wouldn't have, would, would have not happened if it hadn't been for the show. So, you know, for me, it was like being invited to a very intimate dinner, you know, where we all shared all these things. And also it was a good opportunity because when things were normal, you know, when there was a lot of interaction, I think we were all distracted with a lot of good things that were going on, but, you know, being able to see these things in a somehow microscopic way, for me, uh, you know, I think that the reason why I make art is because of this type of thing, you know, to connect with people. And for me, it's been, greatly enriching to have been part of this show and to be in, in this conversation with three generations of uh, initiatives that involve this necessity. So for us, La Panaderia, it wasn't like today, you know, there, there was no art market, you know, there was, to be able to be in a show, I always use the word besaculismo, you know, a lot of artists were like, you should meet this person and that person. And, um, and actually, I've been teaching a class and I have been talking about both your initiatives. You know, I, I, I find them to be completely refreshing and, and um, to be to come come from necessity. You know, it's it, it's things that we need, you know, so these things that we need dictate things. So. Um, so, again, for me to see Tamayo at this stage and to. Uh, have been able to participate and see what happened in this show is, is a great step. Um, so I would love to hear where the necessity of, of your, your spaces comes from. I think I know, but I, I think it'd be nice that you share it so people understand where you're coming from. Maybe Paloma, you want to follow? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Like for me, it's also like quite important to talk like uh, uh, about like artistic education. Like I think like that's a really important thing uh, that affects us in production and in like an imaginarium about what our production is in Mexico City. Like we have to remember that Mexico is like a really centralized country as well. So there's like a lot of uh, like there's like this demand about knowing what's like an institution, what's the offer, etc. 
Like I think also like the space that I belong to, like uh, respond to a demand that there was like, it's quite promiscuous, like the layers you have to go in to, to be an artist. There is not like this uh, myth necessarily of the individual artist just going to uh, her or his uh, studio to do things. It's just like we have, like there's a really intimate relationship between institutions uh, also, there's a lot of absence uh, within the state uh, supporting the arts. So as well, independent spaces like historically responded to an absence of offer to platforms to younger artists. So for me, uh, in, my, in my space specifically, or the space that I belong to, it's a mixed space. Uh, so there are like um, different uh, subjects and also we are not uh, all artists as well. And also there's like a deep interest in how economy uh, goes through the bodies and goes through desire and goes through artistic production. Because I think like that has a lot to do in the way that it's not only talking about like the market, like neoliberalism, capitalism, institution, like there's like a lot of specificity about different bodies and how uh, do we work with that in our artistic production. And also like independent spaces that we have to question what is independent today because the economy has, has been transformed as well. And how that, does that affect like our own desire to do things? Like I feel now, like in pandemic as well, like I feel like this Groundhog Day, like every day is the same, like it seems to. And also like the, the thinking about the future, like we have been negated to think about like a, a, a future that contains a family and contains a private property as well. And a, and a specific way of to be an artist in Latin America. And we can talk a lot about the specificity about uh, class, about race, about centralization, geography, etc. cetera. But um, yeah, like I think like, for me, it's super important to specify, uh, yeah, like the um, the particularities of of what we do in well as an as artist. <laughs> Romeo. Oh yes. Well, <laughs> I, thinking about the necessity that you're mentioning, like I think that when we first started the project, it was we had not very clear that there was a necessity. We were just like eager to start. We we just wanted to do like a thing. We we wanted to have like a little small gar gallery, but we had like a very f a strong focus. Me and my partners, who are Olga Rodriguez because she's like our leader, because she's like the wisest, oldest in the group. And, and, she, and she was very, and, and also Lau Salazar is, is the, the other one of my partners. And she was very, very interested in, in pushing the thought that every show should have like, um, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but like it, it there should be like a, 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 um, a, a rule that you have to have like a, a limit 50-50 women and men, you know, like at least 50% should be women, you know? And 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 we, we, as gay men, like me and Laos, we were like, I think there's like always like, an admiration towards women because like they're if, you know like since kindergarten if you're a gay person they're like the nicest to you they're they don't bully you that much so i think that that's where the link between supporting women's rights is with the gay community even if we don't do not uh interfere with feminist uh discourse but like just supporting them so we we really really connected with that uh that olga said like we should have like it it should be like a rule that at least 50 percent of the shows have to be women so we said well why don't we go even a step further and make it like most of the shows should be women and the rest of them should be like queer people and it just started like that but as it went along we found out that just by all of the sudden we were surrounded by queer people and it by name like from boys to boys people were saying that we were like a queer feminist space which was like a 
two very, very strong words that we do not take lightly because we have so much respect for queer movements, queer political movements, and of course, of feminist political movements. And we would not like to steal that uh, a title, which is like huge to us, but we, we do share the visibility and we, we do love the that we were like bringing visibility to, to like a sort of marginalized group because I mean, we do know that we are three white queer people. And so in the grand scheme of things, we are not like, we're not, we're not so oppressed. So we might not be the 1%, but we, we are kind of the gay 1%. So what you can do with that privilege is like to, to you, you have this privilege that you did not earn, that it was like stolen away for you. So what you can do really is to just try to help everyone that you know that belongs to your community, but, but might not have the same chance that did you, chances that you're, you're getting. So that's what we started. That's what, that was like our purpose. And it went along, it went along very well. And, and it, it started to gain uh, like recognition, which was amazing because that meant that the people who were showing our, our little space, which is a, an old beauty salon <laughs> in, in Escandon and like really, really tiny, but like it, it bring, it brought visibility and, and that's very important because one of the most important like um, struggles that we have is visibility and and even though none of us are, are are part of the trans community we do believe in the LGBT community and that we should all stand together and lastly I would like to say that when we had a panel talking about sex work that was one of the shows that we did at the Gallery Curie Mansuto. And we were, we invited um, a, an artist who she, she's called Javi and she, she works like also as a cam girl to earn money. And she made a very, very important big statement that said that not right now in Mexico, there are no trans women living from their art. And I believe it's the same for like the trans community. And that was like very shocking and very, very um, uh, awakening to us. And, and we, we thought like, well, if we have like this, uh, this uh, space, we should use it to that and like to try to uh, just do a little effort to change that, of course. I guess I, I would love to, to stick to what you just said, you know, like, and, and maybe speak a little bit, bit about uh, visibility, because I guess, or I hope, you know, like, uh, that's what actually like a place like Tamayo can of contribute, course. you know, like to this of kind course. of course. And, yeah. and I'm sorry, I didn't start by that. But <laughs> I'm also like, so grateful. Of course, I, I believe we are all grateful. But like, a, an artist of my age, as you said, and you were speaking at the beginning and saying like, that, that, to my to your generation that was not something that happened you know they they didn't give you a museum no and and, and that wasn't on the agenda either you know like everything that you those please. opportunities like and do the best of it and 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 of course we're really really grateful for that i am very grateful for that and and like also like i as a we lost him. We're losing Romeo a little bit, I think. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm sorry. I, I really don't know what happened, but I'm back. I, I was freaking out, but like, I really have no idea what happened. Like, because the internet is fine. So, <laughs> but, but also, thank you. I, I was thinking about you, uh, what you were saying, like, as well, like, I'm sorry, I was a bit nervous and uh, I didn't think like I, I'm also really grateful to be or to be part of the exhibition. But as well, like uh, we do have like a responsibility uh, around representation and also being able like for me, like how the space has uh, like, even though like when I entered university in 2011, 
Like I didn't imagine that I could have like a, a place in, in an exhibition in Tamayo because in my imaginarium, like the public institutions weren't for me. And that's another negotiation that's happening. Like how do we assume like our, uh, now our place to enunciate uh, certain things? Like for example, within Bikini Wax, that was an independent space that started in a house and it started being an exhibition for younger artists and it evolved. And two years ago, we had like this exhibition in, in Palais de Tokyo. So, and, and there's like these negotiations. So you started being independent and then you, you aren't independent anymore. But we have to be like really able to talk about market, about capitalism and about institution and how does that affect uh, the age that we have and, and also like our own production. So I don't think um, it, it's not less important to be in a place like the Mayo and, and what does it represent now for sure. Some, something that, uh, that really struck me when I first spoke to Paloma, it was, it was, it was very amazing because I first uh, was reading a text that she wrote that she published in her gallery's website. And I, I remember that I devoured that text and, and, and I, it stayed sort of like at the back of my head. And I was thinking about it for a couple of days. Um, and then I looked for her on Instagram and I found her and I was like, hey, can we meet? I, I need to meet you. And we, we arranged a meeting over Instagram. And the first time we met on Zoom, Paloma told me, you are actually the first curator, the first Mexican curator that has ever asked me for a studio visit, which I thought it was really striking. And um, it was really sad also. And it was just, you know, like very, uh, symptomatic of uh, the sort of like environment, like the artistic environment that uh, um, per, it's pervasive in the city. And you know, like this is also a conversation that I usually have with Magali because, and, and I'm sure that Miguel will be able to relate. Uh, but if you read the text, like any artistic text that has been produced in Mexico in the past 20 years, they always refer to what's happening in the city as the scene as the Mexican scene. And something that, I, that I'm very interested in shifting, in shifting that notion and not think that, that to be part of, 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 of a group of professionals, there's, you have to have this performatic element at play, you know? So I, I, I wanna believe that we're pushing, um, we're pushing this group of people to think about a shift between the notions of sin and the notion of community, which has you know, like a totally different uh, understanding of what a group of people is and what it does and how they relate. So for me, um, I think this exhibition and this project was also an opportunity to, to rethink the way in which we relate one another, in which uh, you know, like from the personal to the institutional, for from museums, from artists to artists, from galleries, because there should be these conversations, and there, this should, these conversations should be happening, and should I think be based on generosity, on exchange, on on the exchange of ideas, and I think um, you know, like I'm not. It, it would be naive to think that one exhibition would change a, an environment, but I think that at least we're contributing to pose those questions in terms of how we're relating to each other. I think that's a, it's a great thing that you mentioned that. And I think it's also like super important, just like in the terms of just like phrase it, you know, like the, the difference between a scene and the difference between a community, you know? I think I would say maybe Miguel, you would agree with me. I guess we were probably more part of a scene before and I hope we're heading towards building a kind of community, no? And, and I wouldn't, I would actually think that this is also very much in relation to the pandemic, no? And, and how, oh. of course, you know, like how the scene or what we used to call the scene, I hope that's, you know, like that, that can be like something from the past has also grown. It has like diversified in a way, no? It, it, it was also like a very, very small scene when we, when we started. And again, you know, like since, the uh, institutions weren't like really available since there wasn't, you know, like that uh, 
openness that you know like we've achieved right now to 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 bring about like all those issues that Romeo was mentioning you know like all of that has uh, contributed to this um, to this big change and I'm, I'm pretty sure you know like every time they ask me you know like because I get like more and more you know like this question when I get interviews you know like what where, where do you think the museum is heading or what do you think that is the future of the museum I don't have a clue right it's um it's really I have I have such a hard time you know like just like projecting I'm not sure there is a long term anymore and I'm actually quite happy that there isn't we just need to you know like learn to be much more flexible in and and I guess you know like going back to the scene community you know like uh, probably like this idea of, of community is what makes us flexible and, and what allows us to survive a situation like this no because there's like really no way to have like a rigid structure in planning on our program and again to go back to the very you know like beginning of this conversation probably the, one of the most interesting things about this exhibition particularly is that it was like put together in what two months Humberto, it was like really something that we had to, you know, like improvise in like so many ways, you know, like so like not only in, in, in curatorial terms, but of course, you know, like in financial terms and and when I say financial terms, that means that all of you participated and many, many, many more people, you know, like, of course, you know, like our patrons who actually supported us to do this, uh, this project all of the artists that just came in, you know, like with their own resources to either produce works or just like bring the work with their own cars, other museums that lend us, you know, like vans to just go and pick up works. So it's, I, I think it, it really expands the conversation, you know, like beyond the idea of a scene that was like more um, like oriented towards like the, the ecosystem of the artist, the creator, the critic and the collector and the galleries, you know, like now it's really, I guess that's again one probably of one of the positive things of, about the the pandemia. Yes, I, I was gonna say that that it really felt like an artist museum. You know, it, 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 I felt a shift from it being a curator's museum to something that was handed to the artists some way. I'm not taking credit from the work as curators, but it really felt like it activated, um, as you say, a community and. I don't know if you'll agree, Magali, I don't know if what you're trying to say is that when we started making art, there was somewhat of a cancellation of the past generations. We were somewhat doing of like rebellious acts against the artists that came before us. And the artists before us uh, made acts that were rebellious against the art artists before them. And I feel that this doesn't, it, and it's very, very Mexican, I think, you know, to like, now it's our turn, now it's our turn. And I don't really see the necessity for that. I think that the time has come to really mix things up because I, I mean, Romeo, when I was see, I saw a video of your space and it really, really brought me back to La Panaderia. You know, there was <laughs> Vicky Fox, I don't know. She was a celebrity in the nineties, a trans woman, and she was always there. And I remember yeah. some guy that used to live in La Panaderia was really pissed off that she was there, you know? and. I was like, if you don't like it, it's you who has to go. And this guy ended up punching me behind my back. But you know, this diversity and this mix, I think is worth it because I really, it's, I mean, there are a few cases in our generation, Magali, of people that are older and that like we look up to, but don't you feel that there's a lot of things that have been canceled and it, that it's hard to mix my generation with a lot of older, you know, you, you don't see these mixes that much, or you didn't back then. I don't know. I would I would love to hear what Paloma and Romeo have to say because I, I'm just like I was just like thinking while you were talking that that might be just the result of go us getting older. You know, like and maybe you know like that kind of like like True. you know like push to cancel whatever came before you to make it through might just have to do with age. You know, and now that we're aging, we're just like actually grateful to see that there's like another generation coming behind us no? and and of course you know like we've been working like during this whole year you know 2021 is is the 40th anniversary of the museum which i think is also like worth mentioning because it, it's really you know like it's really this museum that has accompanied us like you and me at least you know like and and of course you Absolutely. too 
like the others because you're younger than us. But it's really the Tamayo that has accompanied us uh, through like all these uh, years. And we've been, you know, like doing like all these interviews with, um, with all, all, you know, like the different actors that were involved uh, since the very beginning, you know, like since the construction of the museum. And, and it's been like really fantastic because uh, it's, it's like, again, you know, like looking towards the generation that preceded us and who also paved the way for everything that we were able to do, you know? So it's like really, you know, like kind of we're trying like really to, to like pay homage to that. But it's also fantastic to see, you know, like that we are just like being pushed aside and, and that there's like, you know, like a force coming behind. But I would love to hear what you have to say, Romeo and Paloma. Yeah. Uh, Paloma, you? please. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Mm, yeah, like I also think a lot about how do we with history as well. And I'm talking not about dead history, but living history. And also like, uh, I was with a friend of mine and uh, we were talking about how to be sexy again. <laughs> and I think like, it's also how are we reading our own desire to produce certain things? Like at some point, like art for me, and that has uh, been like much more, more exaggerated in pandemic. It's how do we, articulate like certain discourse like why do we have to be as artists like to give things as truth or to have relationships as something that is perfect or just showing uh pieces of work that are all circular perfect and justificated and for me like now having an exhibition in in a pandemic is like it's also talks about like we have a lot of questions and we have a lot of, uh, we don't know uh, the way that we are being read into history and at some point it doesn't matter because there's like this um, really strong relationship about reading the history of independent spaces within only uh, within the spaces of the 90s. And, I, and, I, and it's also like, I, I want to, to know more about the specificities of not only uh, the NAFTA agreement and how did that affect in the market and this generation of artists, but as well as, as other specificities of space, of geography, of sex, of love. Like there is a lot of things that I, we don't really know because at some point it's like only one one reading of history in of the independent spaces in Mexico because I, and also the references because in the 90s which were the references? There are the 60s and no grupo and all these other independent spaces well they, they weren't called that way that, that were existing and they were answering like a specific uh, necessity so for me like this is a such a strong exercise of questioning everything and not having any answer because for me answers and truths at some point are patriarchal because you know everything and i don't know nothing so to be able to have a dialogue with artists that I have been admiring, like since I got into university, it opened like not uh, like a lot of also like of questions and admiration for sure. Mm -hmm. I love that you say that because when I first came to the museum and we started, you know, like to to like rework like the whole program identity, etc. I was always telling the team, you know, like we need to make this more sexy than than it is, and and I really, I really meant it exactly. It it's worked. Really, it I worked. believe that but you too. didn't come, Paloma. <laughs> well, I had COVID. <laughs> I was sexy and yeah, alone. But, but your work is very sexy, so it. it <laughs> but you know, like I think I'm thinking about now. what what it means, like what sexiness means, and I think. Be like how I understand it is like this awareness of the body, you know, like this this awareness of who you are, this um, trust in yourself uh, that makes someone sexy. And I think you know, like um, if you think about a museum as a body, I think it's it's very similar. The exercise is very similar. It's knowing who you are, knowing who you work for, who you work with, who's your public, who you're speaking to. And, and I think those have been big questions for this exhibition and you know, like more broadly in this pandemic year. And I think you know, like the complexity, the complexity of the stories that you have right now on display at the museum 
it's 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 really uh, frightening, you know, to learn that there are people coming from indigenous communities, uh, gender non-conforming artists, um, you know, like um, single mothers, um, and so on and so forth. So you know, like I think we're really trying to have these conversations and to allow for these conversations to exist, not only in the artistic community, but we ho we're hoping that these conversations expand. And I think what's important for me is that it doesn't matter if you agree, it doesn't matter if you like it. What matters is that you are able to establish this contact and have these conversations with, um, with, with what, whomever is around you. I think, I think that's true. And I wanted to like uh, talking about what um... Uh, Miguel said right now that that there there was like a, a more friendly uh, environment between their your generation and our generation, and I think because it has become we have become very aware of the of 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 uh, the importance of sexiness and of a sense of humor. And I think that's like the most Mexican in in the best way uh characteristic because i you know like i think that that's something that has brought us to the point of of a very very good resilience that that you know like the, just the assumption of a regal posture in even the most abject environment has really uh connector like our generations is like not taking yourself too seriously just like looking at the world around you and look how absurd it looks but you're just still in there and you instead of complaining and whining about it you're just like trying to best make the best out of it and, and and the best way to do that is just like to make it sexier and funnier and and even if it's a satire i think that is like when we best connect you know like generations because even if we are I, i mean you know just taking for example the work that paloma did like you, the hats i think that it's it is very it has a lot of comedy and it it is very well taken by like your generation you know by you know they they just understand it and and it's because it's uh it's timeless you know sense of humor i think and it's serious work also no it's like as you were saying you know like you're, you're like uh, like paloma is touching on on very um like real and specific and hardcore issues that have to do with politics and economics and Thanks, throwing in the mix like all these kind of also of uh identity issues no and what it means like for like a woman in your position to deal with all these uh Uh, themes that you were, as you were saying before, you know, like you, you can actually, those are themes that were usually like addressed by by men. And it's like, really, there's like a whole patriarchy, you know, like uh, build around the notion of national identity and what that means in, in social and historical terms. So I think it's, it's really, yeah, it's really like approaching the, like maybe the same issues that were, you know, like touched upon by our generation before, you know, like the, Because before it was like maybe a little bit different, you know, like we weren't like living in like through the whatever the 80, 80s meant in terms of NAFTA and all of that. But it's really like like addressing it from a different perspective. So yes, I love that the 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 conclusion to that is like a very glamorous hat. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it it makes you like pay attention and realize that it is important and that it deserves your attention. And it's also like how to be uh, how to be able to talk within the mistake, and also like to be like a middle class woman that I haven't been uh, a, a racializada. I don't know how to say that. Racialized. Racialized. Thank you. Uh, I also want to talk about the dirtiness of these kinds of investigations, and I'm not going to take like a, a lot of time to talk about uh, my work. But as well, like for me, uh, also the sexiness has to has to do to to how to be that kind of dirtiness and promiscuous topics and different interests that that become like a body of work that doesn't have to be uh, had to do to be a, like a correct political artist, you know. Like for me, uh, 
it's it's also like uh, what's happening with with how do we assume uh, the richness of mistakes of not having any answer about what we do things and how, how we do things and also for me that's why so that's why it's so important fiction and it's so, it's not only me writing about science fiction in Mexico and my and the position of the middle class that nobody talks about the middle class because we are too ashamed to talk about our own class. And that's a mistake and that's not well received because I have to, to declass myself in order to, to talk about the interest, uh, interesting things in art. So for me, it's just like, how do we build a fiction, not only me as an artist, but in an exhibition like this, we are, we are doing fictions and there is nothing that is more real than the fiction than history, than, than reading things. And, 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 it, and they are all inter, intertwined between ages, uh, desires, and also like different uh, positions about representation, because that's what we do. We are not the state, we, have, we, are, we just produce images. And that is so powerful now in a context that in, in a country that is not caring for its culture, it's not caring for the art. So um, the institutions are crumbling. So, so yeah, I think it's quite important to 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 do an exhibition like this. I think you said two words that are important that I really see highlighted in the show, and it's promiscuous and dirty. And I think <laughs> in this moment, even though it's at a distance, we really need that. Again, you know, for me, my first impact when I saw even the mounting of the show was so refreshing to see the walls not being respected, you know, things, uh, you know, the, the, the unconventional way the show is curated where one thing blends into the other and it really like represents what should happen outside. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> now we but, need but again, we ended up shooting a film together, Romeo, and that, <laughs> that's nice, you know, how, yeah. how in the world, you know, that was very nice for me. But anyway. Oh, it was nice for me too. That, that's nice. really that's amazing because it's really going to be like a kind of second life for the show to live inside your film you know I think yeah that's yeah 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 that, that will be very exciting I have to go ask each artist one by one if they will allow me to use their artworks so that in <laughs> itself sounds like a really great mission of connection exactly yes if we didn't have enough with this exactly <laughs> no I'm excited <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all. I think this was very, very useful and 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 very. I'm like really happy that we had the the chance and the time to connect again and to and to like really push a little bit forward the conversation that Umberto started already with the with the show. And uh, thank you to our international audience uh, who will probably listen to us in a couple of weeks since uh, all of this is being recorded in Mexico City during the months of February. We're recording, as I said before, in our like our own private spaces because the museum is open. But as soon as the museum will be, uh, the museum is closed, I'm sorry. But as soon as the museum will be open, I hope that many more people would come to see the show because it was really just like on for two weeks before we had to close down again. So I hope <laughs> We'll get the chance to meet there afterwards again. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.